Let's all turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4. And I'm going to tell you before I get started that uh, I'm going to have a big old front porch, or a big, that's what my mother-in-law calls it, a big introduction and a short sermon. But uh, I believe it's what the Lord had me preach today. <clears throat> um, last week we talked about preaching, and I believe the Lord allowed me to adequately show from Scripture that it is the responsibility of every believer in Christ to preach the truth of Scripture, both in God's power, which is His anointed power, the Spirit's filling, if you will, and His power as in His authority, all authority, all power, the King James says, all power is given to me in heaven and in earth. That word translated power there in Matthew 28 uh, in Romans 13 is referring to government. So I'm confident when I say he's talking about his authority. If somebody doesn't believe what we have to say, if they don't follow after what we have to say, their problem is not necessarily with us as a person, though our conduct can make it such. Uh, but really, they are rejecting Christ and Christ's authority in their life. And then with his passion, when we look at sinners, we often are annoyed, we're angered. Um, but he looks at sinners as sheep having no shepherd. He looks at sinners with compassion. Will he judge them? Certainly he will judge them. He must judge them. But at the same time, he gave his life that they might be saved. It's our job to give the truth of the gospel and you really can't understand. What does the word gospel mean? Say that again. Good news. That's right. But really, you can't understand the good news until you understand the bad news. So they do have to understand. Anybody that we talk to must understand that, uh, that God loves them. For God so loved the world, and we could go around and put everybody's name in the room. If I knew everybody of the seven plus billion on the planet, we could put every one of their names in that verse, John three sixteen. For God so loved... Janice, Jerry, Randy, Denise, <coughs> Caden, had a brain glitch there, sorry, Nathan, Drew, Andrew, and so forth, all the way around the room, we can put everybody in there because for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But before we can really grasp that, we have to understand that we're sinners. The Bible calls us the enemies of God. The Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If I compare myself to Andrew, then I'm going to pick his weak points and my strong points and vice versa. If he compares himself to me, he's going to pick my weak points and his strong points. But when any of us try to compare ourselves as to why we deserve heaven, we fall short of God's glory. We fall short of the glory of Jesus Christ. None of us measure up. All of us are subpar. We have to understand that not only are we sinners, are we enemies of God, are we subpar individuals, but that sin has a salary. The wages of sin is death. And as Charles pointed out in Sunday school, that so very clearly is talking about eternal separation from God in a place called hell. Well, I'm going to get out of hell to go to the judgment. No, the Bible says death and hell delivered up the dead. So from within hell, they will face judgment. Judgment. They have to understand that. It's not something to play about. It's not a $25 ticket for running a stop sign. It's eternity in torment. They have to grasp that fact before we can get back to the good news that for a good man, some would dare to die, but God commendeth his love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And then they have to understand that they have to person. And you can know all of that and still spend eternity in hell. There has to come a time when they personally call on God. It, it, it's not the words of a prayer. We use a tract that has a sample prayer on the back. But you could repeat those words till kingdom come and not be saved. It's a heart. I believe in the heart. And confession has to come out my mouth if I truly believe in my heart. And my life is going to change. Look in 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 16. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 16. The Lord impressed this text upon me. I have meditated upon this text most of the week. I want to read it, and then I want to make some things clear, I think, before we get into the text. Like I say, it would be a big introduction and a short sermon, Lord willing. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, and verse number 16, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Notice he didn't... He didn't personalize the doctrine to Timothy. Take heed unto thyself and the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Brother Ashley, would you say a word of prayer before I actually get to preaching?
Amen. Amen. Very well worded. Very well worded. This is the text I believe the Lord would have me expound or explain. It's from the pastoral epistles. So the Holy Spirit has led Paul at this point to teach this, these two books, Timothy, and the book of Titus to teach Titus, and the book of Philemon to teach Philemon how to be a pastor, how to affect the church with the word of God as a pastor. Yet I believe that I can teach you, which are mostly lay people, right? with a portion of this pastoral teaching. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 1, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. So, now is this, is this the job of the pastor? Certainly it is, but it's also the job of every believer to take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine, continue in them, for in so doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Most people, many people... Too many people to count today wax eloquent all the time about the crazy numbers of how many of our youth between the ages of 15 and 30 are leaving the church. I've told you many times that I don't believe that it's any one thing that we can point to, that it is a, a, just a plethora, a multiplicity of things that affect why people are leaving the church. But as I was looking at this last night, I found multiple websites addressing the issue and I want to give you some, some statistics, though sometimes they're quite boring. They are startling, okay? The first statistic, Miss Christie, I want to start with is actually from Canada. Because sadly, in things turning away from Christ, we tend to follow after them. They're typically a little bit ahead of us, okay? In 1971, 1% 1 of Canada's population professed to be non-religious. Now, Canada does, we do a census every so often. They have a whole census bureau. We may have one, but their, their numbers are just much more particular than ours. 1%. Now, what, what are the 60s known for? Brother Jerry, you were a young man in the 60s. What are the 60s known for? A hippie's revolution. Basically throwing off all of the restraints from the previous generation. So that had an effect on the population of Canada, just like it did on the population of us. By two generations later, that number had increased to 23% of Canada professed to be non-religious, professed to see religion as unimportant. That's startling, right? Two generations. So you're talking about from 71 to 91, roughly went from 1% to 23%. In 2002, 66% tripled. 2009, 78%. That's the same road we're on, guys. I'm not talking about Bethlehem. I'm talking about our country. Another website had a statistic, 7 of 10 people between the ages of 15 and 30 said, this is Lifeway Christian Books is who did the, that's a Southern Baptist bookstore. 7 to 10 quit attending church by age 23. There's some other websites I looked at. I've previously told you that I think you can't, you can't narrow it down to just one thing. I think one problem, and I'm going to give you an example of some of the problems that we face. And uh, I'm not saying that the problems are here, but I'm saying every one of us need to look into the mirror of God's Word and have the disciple syndrome. Anybody know what the disciple syndrome was? When Jesus said, one of you will betray me, one by one, all 12 said, is it I? Is it I? So what we need to do, Fud, is look into the mirror of God's word and say, am I guilty? Lord, am I where I should be on these things? I think one problem, and I've made it, we've been doing a, a series on child rearing, and I've enjoyed it. I hope you're enjoying it. We're probably about halfway through it. But one thing is well-meaning, but aired parenting. I'll give you an example. Parents for 
at least the last couple of generations, maybe the last three generations, depending upon how you define a generation, maybe even the last four. Okay, it was the 70s when, of course, I was a little kid, so I don't know, Brother Jerry or, or Charles or somebody that, that was a little older than me in the 60s might know if they heard the term youth pastor, but I heard the term youth pastor about 78, first time I heard such a term. Okay, <clears throat> and so since, at least since the beginning of the youth pastors, parents as a whole across our country have depended upon a youth pastor, a Sunday school teacher that has a child at best an hour and a half a week, 30 minutes Sunday morning, 30 minutes Sunday night, 30 minutes Wednesday night, to disciple their children. But you coach a football team, as I have done in the past. Youth pastor, I heard it just this week. It gives me chills when I tell you this story. Youth pastor asked a family, said, hey, I missed you last week at church. Everybody okay? Oh, we're a sports family. We had balls. Five years later, the teenager's grown and out the home and not coming to church. You know what the parents said, Christy? That youth pastor failed our teenager. No, the parents failed the teenager because they taught him that baseball or basketball or football was more important than the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I tried to show you over the last year a couple of different times. I've done some series you might remember. One particular time, I read doctrinal statements from various groups of Baptists. I read the Southern Baptist doctrinal statement, the GIBF, which is the Global Independent Baptist Fellowship, the BBFI, the Baptist Bible Fellowship International. Uh, I've read the ABA doctrinal statement. I even threw in the Free Will Baptist doctrinal statement, and I at least told you a little bit about the Primitive Baptist. We found a few differences. One particular difference with the Free Will Baptist uh, maybe two points with the Primitive Baptist, but basically as I looked at them, I felt like we had far more in common with all those groups than we had different. But there's one similarity amongst all those groups. And I have recently found out it's not just Baptist. It, it's, it's Presbyterians, Lutherans. It, it's these... Somebody said it this week, I thought it was kind of comical, but it's funny. Non-denominational has kind of become a denomination, has it not? We have non-denominational churches all across the country. So even non-denominationals share this one characteristic, Brother Jerry. And the problem with this one characteristic that they all share is the Bible that we claim to preach condemns it. And that's pride. Every group of Baptists I have ever met feel like they are more superior than any other group of Baptist. We, we feel like we're closer to God than everybody else. And we take what we understand and make it this, this pharisaical idea that if you don't do it just like we do, you can't be right with God. I can't find it in here. Jesus said, forbid them not. They said, hey, we saw somebody else preaching in your name and casting out devils, and we forbade them. And he said, forbid them not. If they are not against me, they are for me. You say, oh, it's just Baptist. No. I'm going to give you some more examples of that in just a second, but I recently heard a Presbyterian that, that I don't know him personally, but I'm acquainted with his ministry, if you will, say, <clears throat> we don't believe that, you're not that you can't go to heaven and not be Presbyterian. I'm not wording this exactly right, but basically, we don't believe that you can't go to heaven if you're not Presbyterian, but we wouldn't advise you risk it. And he said that actually with a chuckle. And this very revered, and respected wise man I know named Charles Richard Marshall once told me that we often joke about what we really feel. But I was at a, a meeting in Maryville, Tennessee. That's Maryville if you're not from there, but it's M-U-R-V-I-L-L -L if you're from there, Maryville. Okay, Baptist churches. There were missionary Baptist churches, Southern Baptist churches, independent Baptist churches. They were going to have a citywide meeting down at this public school football field. And the host church was a Southern Baptist church, and they called on a deacon 
that I don't know how old he was, but he looked, Brother Chris, like he was 90. They called on him to close this luncheon before the meeting that night and following nights. They called on him to close the, the prayer. I'm trying to get you to see that Christians in general have become quite pharisaical, and I believe this is one reason people are leaving the church and why people fail to come to church. I don't know anybody that I've met besides this one old gentleman who would word a prayer like this, but he said, Lord, we thank you for using us. We ain't much, but we the best you got. Now, I don't know anybody else that would word a prayer like that, but I do know that too many Christians today have that opinion. We don't have the disciple syndrome. We've almost got a God syndrome, how we think we're better than everybody else. Help me, Lord. Let me tell you what a millennial said about why millennials are leaving the church. I've read a good little bit about the lady. I believe she is a Christian. Her name is Rachel Held Evans. And she said, clearly, no, let me get here. She said, millennials have been made to think by the preaching of the last 20 to 30 years that Christianity is simply a list of do's and don'ts. Now, I'm going to go back to my thoughts for a second. I think we can see that Christianity as a list of do's and don'ts is by definition pharisaical. It is by definition anti-grace. That is not the fulfilling life God desires for us. In fact, I believe that to be empty and fruitless as the rituals of Catholicism, the mania of Islam, or the inconsistency of Hinduism. Back to her thoughts. Listen to this, CJ. She said, we, millennials, are not leaving the church because we don't find it cool. In that, Kayla, she addressed the fact that when, she, obviously, she seems to have some kind of ministry going around trying to tell people how to reach millennials, and she said that she talks to people, and they, don't, they, they listen to what she has to say, and then they turn around and they think, oh, if we just had some edgier music, if we just had the dark stage, if we just had those disco lights like some of the churches, and I use that loosely, uh, have today, then we could reach the millennials. She said, we're not leaving the church because we don't find the cool factor there. We're leaving because we don't find Jesus there. <clears throat> I don't know about y'all, but that breaks my heart. That's a very eye-opening thought. For the sake of time, I'm going to refer not to Bethlehem, but to Christians in general as we. <clears throat> we want people to agree with us on the King James Bible. We want people to agree with us not only on the importance of the local church. When we went through that doctrinal statement, I showed you that every Baptist group out there believes in the local church and doesn't think you can be right with God if you're not involved with your local church. But we have gauges to determine if someone is local church enough for us to fellowship with. There's a preacher I know of. He's not too terribly close to us, but he's starving for fellowship. He's one of the few Baptists in his area. There's another church just a few miles away in the same town where this guy buys groceries. But because that other church, that pastor over there, he's starving for some fellowship too. I actually know him a little better than the other one. Both of them are starving for fellowship. But the one Randy practices closed communion like we do, and the other one practices close communion. And so they won't fellowship with one another because of one letter in the alphabet. Can we not see that silly? Can we not see that's anti-productive to reaching people for Christ, to encouraging one another? Look, <clears throat> I could introduce you to a preacher. Here's Jared, what I said I was going to call your name. I could introduce you to a preacher that, that Fudd knows real well who lives probably 50 miles from here. And Michael, Christy, Emma, Kendra, Jake, 
Chris, Bo, Jerry, CJ, you couldn't possibly be right with God in his mind. You know why? He says no Christian sits on the back row. Christian means Christ-like. Can we not see how stupid that is? I mean, is that true everywhere? What if it's standing room only? Is, is the back reserved for lost people? This is crazy, people. <laughs> There's this preacher I know. He's dead now, Kinder. He died of a heart attack. He, I, I'm fat. In fact, according to the doctors, I'm morbidly obese, and he makes me look like Nathan, or did when he was living. I'm sure he's kind of shrunk up with a few years in the grave. He preached at Robertson Chapel Baptist Church when I was a boy. I wasn't there, but the pastor was a good friend of my dad's. In fact, he led my dad to the Lord, Randy. This preacher was there, and I'm talking about, I mean, two chins doesn't do it justice, okay? And, you know, people used to make, I, I like banana pudding. I've, I've made that clear here. If it's original banana pudding, the one that's got custard on the bottom, it's not actually pudding, it's custard, and got meringue on top. And I don't, I, I don't know, but they used to make, in other words, I don't know the process of it because I'm no cook, but they used to make it in these glass dishes. And they, I mean, you'd think that glass dish would hold a gallon, Andrew. I mean, it's a big old dish. They brought that to the table, and he looks to the pastor and says, where's your, where's your servant? He took, Jared, just a few spoons full and put it in a bowl and gave it to the pastor, who was really about Randy's size, I think my wife would, would admit, just gave him a little serving. And this preacher, Brother Jerry, ate the whole bowl, a gallon of it. But do you know how many sermons I've heard him preach about spitting white and living right? In other words, if you ever put tobacco in your mouth, you can't be as spiritual as he is, but he's killing himself with his spoon. How stupid is that? Now, I don't want you to go chew tobacco. I'm glad Charles gave it up. I'm glad God worked in his life. But you see how we draw these pharisaical lines? It's okay to be a glutton, but it's not okay to chew tobacco. Come on. Is this, this is where we live in. Hey, th there's one verse in the Bible. Doth not nature teach you to teach you? It's uh, nature itself teach you that if a man hath long hair, it's a shame. That may not be exact words, but it's in 1 Corinthians 11, 14, if you want to look it up. How many sermons have, have I, I can't tell you how many sermons I've heard in my lifetime on long hair. In fact, that same preacher, Brother Randy, my dad, in the 70s, everybody had their hair over their ears, right? Everybody said I have big ears. You know why? Because my daddy made me over the years and off the collar. And I forget what they call it, but where it kind of gets shorter at the bottom, tapered. I, had to, I couldn't cut it off straight. I had to taper it up in the back. I, I mean, I don't care. I live. But I'm saying I, I got made fun of because my hair was so short. And dad and I came from the barber shop to visit this preacher that he loved because this preacher led him to the Lord. And the preacher told him we wasted our money at the barbershop because our hair wasn't short enough. Where do we have scripture for that? We separate over the most idiotic things. It was a sermon pointed directly at my father because he had on wire rim glasses. Man, I'm telling you, we ate eggs for supper sometime, not because we wanted breakfast for supper, but because the chickens were laying and we didn't have much else to eat. My daddy wore those wire rim glasses because they were the cheapest glasses available and, and we were poor. Where do we get that? I have actually heard a sermon, Randy, we're talking about list of do's and don'ts. Now maybe our list is not as ridiculous as some of the ones I'm giving you, but I think we have list of do's and don'ts that we expect people to live by if we're going to try to reach them for Christ. I've heard sermons about parting your hair on the left side of your head. Bo can't part his hair on the left side of his head. It won't go that way because his part's on the other side. When I was at Bible college, I went to one of the most conservative Bible con con colleges that I know of. Women were never allowed to wear pants. 
you couldn't have facial hair unless you were above 25 years of age because you had to prove that you had had, you basically had to tell them you'd had your beard or your mustache for at least, I, I don't remember if it was five years or 10 years, but it was a period of time that you had to have. Well, if it's wrong for an 18 year old to have it, is it wrong for a 25 year, if it's wrong, if it's okay for the 20, where do we get that? Now I went by the rules, Kayla, because I joined them, they didn't join me. But isn't that silly? Making a rule of fellowship about your facial hair. Now one smart aleck evangelist I heard in the 90s said, shave your eyebrows or shut up. You know, I kind of liked his opinion even though it wasn't very loving. But ostrich skin cowboy boots. Now I bought these on eBay and I didn't get very much for them. But when I was younger, made good money, wasn't married, I had a pair of ostrich skin boots for every day of the week. And I mean, I've always been that guy kind of likes clothes, okay? I had, I had a brown pair, I got a pair, I had a pair that matched uh, uh, Michael's belt there, you know, I had a red pair, I had a maroon pair, I had a black pair, I, just, I, I liked ostrich skin boots. The last pair I kept was the last pair that I had bought, you know, they wear out over time. I kept a pair of black full quill ostrich and they were full quill all the way up. Uh, I wouldn't tell you what I paid for them, but more than I would be willing to give for boots today. But at Bible college, they kept hammering me on if I was right with God, I wouldn't wear those boots. Not the instructors now, the other, the other pupils, the other students. And I'll be honest with you, they messed with me until I got in the flesh. And I asked the boy, I said, what'd you give for that suit you're wearing? He told me. I said, these boots are worth two outfits you're wearing. I'm sick of hearing, wear your best for God, and I can't wear my boots. These boots cost twice as much as that suit you're wearing, and I'm, I'm done. What, does the, what do these things matter? This whole short hair thing, do you know where it comes from? This buzz, like I wear, like Chris has got on today. Do you know where this haircut originated? Anybody want to hazard a guess? The trenches of World War I to fight lice. Previous to that, look at pictures of preachers from the 1800s and 1700s, and they had longer hair than anybody in this room, except the ladies, of course. <clears throat> We draw these lines over separation. Y'all know that, that revival's very heavy upon my heart. In fact, the Lord has kind of broken my heart that it's not as heavy as it once was in the last year. Did you know that no national revival on this continent or any other continent has been denominational specific? Miss Janice said a week or so ago that she knew prayer was important to me, and I hope she'll bear witness that I confess to her that I don't feel like I ever pray enough. We had meetings on Thursday nights to pray for revival. Anybody remember the biggest number we ever had come? because Charles busted me about my math I said 13 you're right 12 people do we really want to see our friends and family saved if we're not willing to pray about it there's some exceptions there's some exceptions in the room that I'm very thankful for, and I, I believe it glorifies God. But I think the vast majority of American Christians should answer that question. No, because our actions or our lack of action proves that we're saved and we don't give a rip if somebody else gets saved or not. Because we don't make time to pray about it, and we don't make time to witness to people. Again, there's except, there are exceptions in the room. but This ought to break our hearts, man. Our country is going to hell quickly. And we read what we read about Nineveh. We're in the same boat with Nineveh. Life is not precious here. The dollar is precious. Life is cheap. 
you don't believe that, look at the abortion rates. Look at the murder rates. Look at the fact that eight people were killed in Mississippi today. All that was introduction. Now it's preaching time. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine, continuing them, for in so doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Take heed unto thyself. What we have done over my lifetime as Christians, and I'm not talking about specifically Bethlehem. I'm frankly talking about any church I've ever been in in my life. We take heed to everybody else. We want to make sure they're living right. We want to make sure they're doing right. Ford, we want to make sure they're sitting in the right place in church. We want to make sure that only the right people are in the choir. We want to make sure that they're toting the right Bible, dressing the right way. But the Bible says take heed unto thyself. We need to look into the mirror of God's word about ourselves. Pay attention to myself. I'm talking about John. People leaving the church or avoiding the church because they see a pharisaical inconsistency on our part. Now, none of us are going to be as, as consistent as we should. But for God's glory, we should. The fact that we're going to give an account, Romans 12 and several other scriptures tell us, for every deed done in the flesh as believers, we're going to give an account. That should make us want to take heed to ourselves, to our conduct. Check our personal prayer time. Check our personal Bible study. Check our relationship with our spouses and with our children. Check our relationship to our employer or our employees. Check our daily walk and our daily talk. All of these things are supposed to glorify God. Matthew 5 says they should see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. Take heed unto thyself. Take heed unto the doctrine. It's true that doctrine is important. It is. But the only doctrine that matters to the lost people around us is the doctrine of soteriology. We might say, Jake, that the doctrine of, I can never pronounce this one right, homardiology. So we don't even know what those $2 words are. It's okay. The only reason I do is because I went to Bible college. Soteriology is the doctrine of salvation. Harmodiology is the doctrine of sin. They don't care what Bible we use. They don't care how we dress when we go to church. What they need to know is that they're lost and on the road to hell and that they need Jesus Christ and he's the only way to heaven. Those, that, that's what's important to them. We get so tied up in our ecclesiology. That's the doctrine of the church. And it's important. We get tied up in our bibliology. We get tired up in our eschatology. We get tired up in our anthropology, our pneuma, even our doxology. We determine this church is right with God and that church is not right with God over the, the music or the style of music that they use. But we get tied up in these things to the point that we are letting the world around us go to hell. Don't get me wrong. They have the light of creation according to Romans chapter 1. They have the light of conscience and the light of the commandments or scripture in Romans chapter 2. If you go back to Romans chapter 1, it's God's plan that they have the light of a Christian. Turn with me to Ezekiel, to Ezekiel, please. Ezekiel 33. Turn with me to Ezekiel 33, please. Ezekiel 33. I'm going to read you seven verses of scripture on this take heed to the doctrine. I know I'm long today, but I promise I'm going to come in for a landing shortly. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people, and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon a land, if the people of the land take a man of their coast and set him for a watchman, if when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people, then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood should be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not the warning, his blood should be upon him. But he that taketh the warning shall be delivered, shall deliver his soul. Verse 6, But if the watchman see the sword come and blow not the trumpet and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take away any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. 
So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. If they die in their sins, Fudd, they die in their sins. But if I don't blow the trumpet, if I don't witness, if I've not shared that doctrine of salvation, God says he'll, apply, he'll take the blood at my hand. That should be sobering. To whom have you truly given a verbal witness this week? For whom have you or I prayed to be saved, to be rededicated if they're already saved, to be surrendered, to be sold out? These things should bring us to tears. It's not good enough to check this stuff off a list. I prayed this prayer in 1998, so I'm good. It's that foolish idea that we can pray some prayer or another and never have a changed life that leads people to believe salvation can be lost. It's that foolish idea that sends people to hell because they see professing Christians acting like the world Monday to Saturday. And that they think if that's Christianity, then they don't need it. Remember what Miss Evans said? We don't come to church because we don't see Jesus there. If we take heed to ourselves that our lives are a daily, moment-by-moment moment reflection of Christ, if we take heed to our doctrine, I'm not saying compromise our position on the church or any of these other things, but God be glorified, we must be sharing the doctrine of salvation. Those two things, taking heed unto ourselves that our life is right, taking heed to our doctrine that we're preaching right, brings to phrase to mind a phrase that I see over and over in the New Testament, and that's word and deed, or deed and word. That's our witness. We've got to continue in both of those things. It's just like any other aspect of the Christian law. If I get over here and I'm all tied up in my deeds, then that can be another false religion. If I get over here and I'm all tied up in my doctrine, then that's just another false religion. If it's truly both of them, that's when people are going to be saved. Why do we continue in them? Well, Hebrews 23, excuse me, 10, 23 says that we should be faithful because God is faithful and he promised us. But the second reason we should be faithful to our doctrine and to ourselves, to check ourselves to make sure we're living for God, is because we save ourselves and our hearers. Hmm. Let me close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you today and I confess to you that I have failed all too often to take heed to myself and to my doctrine. Lord, I know that not only is this true for me, but it's true for preachers all around this country. We have failed to take heed to ourselves and to our doctrine. Lord, it's not just true for preachers, but it's true for people in the pew, Lord. And I confess to you, for our people, as Nehemiah did for his, that we are guilty in these United States of America of trying to check off some kind of ritual, trying to make some list of do's and don'ts for Christianity rather than nurturing that daily relationship with you that you so much desire and by which you reach people around us. Lord, make me that, make me that seed sower. Make me that husband that people look at and see Christ as the head of the church. Make me that father that people look at and see their heavenly father. Lord, make me that employee that people look at and say, that's how a Christian ought to act. And Lord, I, I don't just pray that for John, but I pray that for Bethlehem. Lord, I pray you would make the men of this church husbands and fathers that would reflect Christ. Lord, I pray you would make the men of this church the employers or employees that reflect Christ, Lord. I pray that you would make the ladies of this church virtuous women 
that all the world around them cannot help but look and see you at work in their lives. Lord, we, we call on you because we are so weak and beggarly. We cannot do it apart from thee. We need you to work on us. Lord, I pray for our teenagers. I pray that you would make them lights at school, Lord. It's so, just like Charles pointed out to us in Sunday school, Lord, we have to affect the lost. But if we're not careful, we allow the lost to affect us, Lord. I pray you'd work in Bo's life and CJ's life and Jake's life and Michael's life and Jared's life. That they would be the witnesses you'd have them to be at, at school, Lord. And that they would, that would reflect you and not allow the world around them to draw them down into the sin that is so rampant around us. Lord, send a revival. I don't care if it takes World War III. I don't care if it takes a depression that makes the 30s look like some kind of affluent period in American history. I don't care if it takes a drought like in First Kings there, Lord. I just ask you to send revival. Not just to the people of Bethlehem, Lord, but to the people of our country. Lord, I pray that you would give us the eyes that you gave Habakkuk and that you gave Nahum, that they look around and see the burden that the lost people around them are under. Help me to see that. Lord, work in our midst. Change us. Turn us that we'll be turned to thee. We love you. We pray these things not for John's honor, not for the honor of Bethlehem, not for the honor of the ABA, not for the honor of Baptist, not for the honor of Christians, but for the honor of Christ, for the glory of Christ, that Christ would be glorified in everything that is said and done. And Lord, most specifically, we ask you to save souls and help those of us who are saved to be both surrendered and serving. For it's in his name I ask it. Amen. What's your number, Brother Randy? 150.